In this session, let's have a good amount of understanding of the basal, especially uh, the basal accord which is called as basal 1, the basal 2 and the solvency 2 regulation for the insurance company. Basal 1 and basal 2 are primarily targeted towards the banking sector, whereas the solvency 2 is more and more targeted towards the insurance sector. So these are the international standards with respect to the regulations of the banks and the insurance companies. Why do we really need to regulate the banks? Typically, if we see the way the banks perform their business, they collect the deposits from the individual uh, from the individuals and in turn do the lending with that uh, deposited amount, provide different kinds of loans. So they may be uh, taking the deposits on a short term basis, but they may be giving loans on a long term basis. Now, this money keeps rotating, right? Because whatever uh, the short term deposit that has come in, out of that the bank, let's say, has lent to someone, the person who has uh, borrowed it, he is going to purchase something. So, whosoever has sold that, he got the cash and he is again depositing that same money with the bank. And the money the bank has got, again it is giving some amount of loan. So, overall, the total loans to the kind of uh, deposits or the capital the bank has got is much, much more. So, to make sure that the bank keeps enough capital to meet the risks that are coming up is what is the major objective of any regulation. And the government of any country wants this probability of default of the bank to be as low as possible because when a bank is defaulting, it's going to impact the entire financial system. People will lose confidence in the banking system, which will, which will have a huge impact on the functioning of the economy. So because of that reason, the governments typically want a stable economic environment. So they want to make sure that the banking system in the country is more and more effective and efficient. The bank's default rate is much, much lesser. This is what will boost a lot of confidence in the banking system. And this regulation typically will help the banks even more and more aware of the risk that they are taking. If there was no regulation, let's assume that there is no regulation. The banks are doing the business. So as a business uh, performing uh, organization, they would be aware of their risks and they would be handling their risks. If that's the case, lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, financial crisis could not have occurred. Lot of uh, banks uh, being bailed out would not have occurred, which means historically that did not happen. Banks were taking more and more risk compared to what they were supposed to take what would have been a comfortable business for the bank. They did not get into that process. So it is very much clear that the regulation is playing an important role in making the banks aware of the risk that they are taking. Now, if I look at a slightly different perspective, the government is providing deposit insurance to the individual because when each individual is depositing their money with the bank. They are depositing it so confidently because even if this bank is defaulting or even if this bank is failing, the government is going to protect the interests of the depositors and it is going to protect their deposits. That is what we are terming as deposit insurance. And because the government is actually uh, uh, giving that kind of additional layer of confidence, 
even the banks are becoming a bit more aggressive in terms of lending because even if they default the government is going to protect them so if that uh, assurance from the government was not there probably uh, the banks would have uh, stopped improving their business stopped getting their businesses because new deposits would not have come because the depositors might have very well felt that the banks uh, are lending much much more than what they have deposited so probably uh, uh, they find that the banks are becoming very very risky and new businesses for new deposits would not have come into the bank just because the bank was offering that kind of uh, security or a deposit insurance to the customers the made the banks take more and more risk so that is the kind of a facility which the government has uh, given to the banks which means now the government uh, can very well control that particular capital because it should not go in such a way that the bank is just taking the risk because the government is protecting the insurance it should not send that kind of wrong signals it should uh, still be restricted to the point that the government is uh, providing the deposit insurance because the economy needs to be uh, developed people need to gain confidence in the banking system and that's the reason the government is uh, typically uh, allowing the banks to take more risk only to that extent which means the bank uh, the government has to put some kind of controls in the way the banks manage their capital and that is where the regulations are coming up with respect to the capital requirements and one of the main problems with the banking industry more severe compared to the other industries is the systemic risk the system as a whole can collapse failure of one bank because of the various transactions that this particular bank has with the other banks and because of the interconnectivity between the various banks in terms of lending and borrowing we could clearly see that failure of one bank could create a kind of ripple effect and cause the other banks also to fail when all the banks are failing the whole financial system is getting collapse and this losses from the financial sector even get carried to the real economy sector which will impact the gdp growth of the country as well so that is the reason the banking system collapse is treated as uh, one of the major collapses of the economy it can it can result in wide bigger damage compared to any other industry collapsing that is one more reason the governments really want to take enough care to make sure that the banking system does not collapse in their country and that is where the governments even are faced with a tricky problem especially if large financial difficulties surface with good financial organization any large financial organizations they even have a mindset among themselves that they are too big to fail because if the government fails them if the government does not provide support to them if the government allows them to fail it is going to impact the overall financial system and it is going to into a loss but at the same time if the government is doing a bailout it is sending wrong signals to the market and at the same time it makes the large organizations feel more and more comfortable take more and more risk take the system into hands and they don't come out with any kind of vigilance in terms of controlling the risk so that kind of wrong signals should not be sent it sent to the banking world so that's where a kind of a dilemma exists with the government if a large financial institution is failing should it allow it to fail or should it bail it out probably the best example comes out as the 2007 crisis when a large number of financial institutions were facing aggressive financial difficulties majority of them have been bailed out by the uh, by the government except for lehman brothers which was allowed to fail again the intention was straight forward the lehman brothers which was allowed to fail just because the bank was the, the government wanted to sell send some signals to the community that 
the bailouts are not automatic. You can't take things for granted. So the government uh, is sending some kind of signals that uh, not, uh, not every uh, financial institution can take the opinion that it is too big to fail. If it fails, probably the economy is going to be disturbed. So uh, the government uh, will bail out. That kind of a notion should not exist. That is one reason Lehman Brothers was allowed to fail. And at the same time, it was that kind of a move by the government was heavily criticized because the crisis became even more worse because of the failure of that one large organization. Now, looking at the regulations, probably 1988 marks the first time where internationally a set of standards have been arrived at typically called as the Basel Accord or Basel One. But before that 1988, every country has its own regulations with respect to the capital requirement. So they have decided, they have worked out at the local layer what should be the minimum levels of capital to the total assets. Depending on the total assets, what should be the amount of capital that needs to be maintained by the banks. And uh, even the amounts differed from current country to country, the percentage differed from country to country, and even the strictness in terms of implementation of these norms varied from country to country. Now, banks had multinational operations. Right, banks were having branches in multiple countries. Banks had so many international transactions with uh, various parties across the world. Now, banks tried to take advantage of this. How well they were able to take it up? Very straightforward. In whatever the country, the controls are weaker, they tried to take advantage of those countries. Wherever the country, wherever uh, the, the, the capital requirements were more and more stringent, they, 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 they were acting, uh, they, they were uh, moving their business more and more to those countries where the capital requirements were more relaxed. So, and along with that, even they have played the accounting games with respect to consolidation of the data of the sub subsidiaries into the prime uh, financial statement. This has created some kind of virals in the market, which has resulted in a team coming up in terms of understanding the need for regulations that are uniform across the world. And uh, that is where the, the first move came up that the banking sector's regulations should be global, not at a local level. Along with that, in the late 80s and early 90s, the type of transactions that the banks were typically entering into, they were becoming more and more complicated. The derivatives market started flourishing. So, interest rate swaps, currency swaps, foreign exchange swaps, options, lot of stuff was typically getting created and they are all over-the-counter derivatives. Over-the-counter derivatives is creating a scenario where two parties are getting into a contract among each other, looks like a kind of a proprietary kind of a contract. Most of the time, these trades are not, um, are not highlighted in the balance sheet at all, which means all these transactions were typically off-balance sheet transactions. So there was no change in the level of assets or liabilities reported by the bank because the assets did not change, even the capital requirements did not change. That is what has created even more a trouble uh, and a requirement that even the derivatives transactions that are becoming a significant proportion of the assets of the bank needs to be taken into consideration while determining the capital. And the credit risk taken by the bank because of these derivative transactions was uh, increasing because of the new risk that got introduced, which is the counterparty risk. A counterparty defaulting is also creating a new risk for the bank because the capital of the because uh, 
the bank uh, the bank's value is going down because of the counterparty defaulting so they have clearly realized that whatever was the mechanism they have used earlier some capital to the total assets now total assets is not an important criteria is not a good indicator so there should be some kind of a change that has to come up in the way the capital requirements are computed and that is where the basel committee was formed with uh, uh, 12 countries representing it and the meetings being held at basel in switzerland and they have come out with uh, a primary uh, a primary set of rules in 1988 which is called as basel uh, bis accord and later on it was typically uh, started uh, getting called as basel 1 so looking at the significant things of the 1990 1988 bis accord probably this can be quite comfortably said that this has led to the significant increase in the resources the banks have devoted towards measuring the risk understanding the risk and managing the risk they have the basel accord has created uh, has sent lot of vibrations into the banking sector that risk management is one of the important activities of the bank they need to uh, have sufficient processes in place to measure it to understand it to manage it and make sure that uh, their probability of default is much much lesser so as per as a part of their first propositions the uh, the accord was simply talking about the banks assets to the capital ratio should be less than 20% so which if i put it on the other side the capital to the total assets should be greater than 5% right the bank's asset to the total capital is less than 20 or capital to total asset should be greater than 5% most of the banks were having that kind of uh, uh, that kind of numbers by that time but the major change that came in was the cooks ratio which was coming out with the total credit exposure wherein it was looking at two major components one is the component associated with the balance sheet items the other is the numbers that are associated with the off balance sheet items earlier in the regular mechanism the off balance sheet items were not at all included in the computation of the capital but this model came out with the inclusion of off balance sheet items also as a part of the capital computation one of the significant changes both the on balance sheet as well as off balance sheet items are considered to calculate the total risk weighted assets when it comes to the balance sheet item there is a risk weight that is assigned to each one of them reflecting the amount of credit risk now if i see here all those items that are represented in the balance sheet okay if it is cash there is no risk associated with it gold bullion claim on oecd uh, government treasury bonds residential mortgages which are fully insured for all of them the weight is zero and uh, claims on banks and uh, public sector entities such as securities which are issued by the us government agencies or municipality claims there was a slight risk associated with them so 20% is in, uh, assigned to it residential mortgages for which uh, the the insurance is not existing they are carrying 50 and all other corporate bonds and everything were assigned 100% risk weight so depending on what is the kind of as what are the kinds of loans the government the bank has given a risk weighting is being assigned to each one of them which is a reflection of the credit risk and the weighted average of each one of them is computed typically to find out uh, the 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 risk weighted assets which are on the balance sheet and if they are off balance sheet items 
there is a credit equivalent uh, amount that is being computed. CI is the credit equivalent amount that is computed, which is as good as a loan principal that is considered to have the same credit risk. So there is a kind of a mapping that is being done between the off balance sheet item and a loan that is equivalent to the same as, as a part of the credit risk. And now when they are non-derivatives, a direct conversion factor is uh, being applied which reflects the principal amount of that instrument. So whatever is the principal amount, some X, a conversion factor is applied on it and this is what would be the risk weight of that particular. Whereas when it talks about the OTC derivatives, the calculation is slightly different. It takes into account the maximum of the value of the security to the bank, to the lender or zero. So if the value of that particular derivative is positive, yes, I'll show it as positive. If the value to the bank is negative, when the when is the value to the bank negative? When it is positive to the counterparty. So the value to the bank is positive, we'll take V. When the value to the bank is negative, we'll take it as zero. And to this, we are adding a, another multiplier or another term, which is for the total principal amount, some kind of an add-on factor, which reflects the future exposure. Because derivative securities are such that Today the exposure might be negative, but tomorrow the exposure might turn positive or it could be vice versa. So that is where we not only compute uh, the current exposure for them, we also compute the future possible exposure. That is the reason we see that for derivative securities, we, we, we observe that the requirement is not just look at the current exposure, you add some kind of a factor even to the future exposure, uh, which is as a percentage of the total principal amount, add it for the future exposure and uh, that is what will become your risk weighted. And whatever are the total risk weights, you multiply it for that particular counterparty, depending on what is the counterparty. If it is a corporate, you will multiply it with some percentage. If it is an OECD bank, you are going to multiply it with some other percentage to typically uh, compute the overall risk weighted assets. So this is how the typical capital computation comes out. Uh, uh, requi the requirement of the risk weighted assets typically come out uh, as a part of the bank's uh, capital computation process of 1980 record. Now, so once that risk weighted assets are totally computed, it says that the capital should be at least 8% of that. And in that, again, there is a breakup of tier 1 and tier 2 capital. Tier 1 is purely equity and non-cumulative perpetual preferred stock because they are the ones which are going to absorb majority of the losses, the first losses that are going to come. Primarily, the equity is a very uh, stringent requirement. That is where it says 2% of the risk weighted assets should definitely be in the form of common equity because that is that portion which absorbs the first set of losses. Then comes the tier 2 and even that is a requirement which says 50% of the total required capital should be in the form of tier 1 which means 4% of the risk weighted assets uh, at least should be in the form of tier 1 capital. And there is a tier 2 capital which is a supplementary capital which consists of cumulative perpetual preferred stock, long term debentures, subordinate debt which is having an original life of more than 5 years and they are all subordinated. They have lesser preference in the claims after the depositors means the depositors' interests are still protected even in these kind of instruments. Wherever the depositors' interests are protected, whichever is the form of capital where the, which have the priority of the claims, 
uh, lesser compared to that of depositors, they can be included, uh, they can be treated as the capital. Those things go as a part of the tier 2 capital. So, tier 1 and tier 2 put together should be at least 8%. But what we see is some local regulators, regulators in some countries, they directly prefer the number to be uh, slightly on the higher side, more than what has been uh, prescribed by Basel. And in some cases, the banks themselves, to make sure that they get a better credit rating, they try to uh, put a number much higher than what has been said by the Basel Accord. And during that, once that accord came into picture, and as a as a uh, consequence of heavy derivatives trading that is uh, that started occurring in the 90s. There is a G30 policy recommendation that has uh, typically come up during that particular period which talk about uh, overall 20 risk management recommendations targeted towards the dealers and the end users of the derivatives, four specific recommendations targeting the legislators, the regulators and the supervisors. And all these things, this entire recommendations came based on a detailed survey performed on 80 dealers and 72 end users overall across the world using questionnaires and in-depth interviews. Few interesting things which look more common to us right now, nowadays, but at that point they were more and more uh, impact oriented. Because some of the key points that they brought out, the risk management policies which are being set up by the uh, bank or the government, it should be clearly defined. Each of the policy needs to be approved by the senior management. And to a large extent, it should be approved by the board as well. And the managers at all the levels need to enforce those kind of uh, requirements uh, as a part of their implementation. All the derivatives position should be marked to market. Settlement needs to happen. The value needs to be computed at least once in a day. All the dealers, they should measure the market risk using a consistent measure. The value at risk was, uh, was uh, being accepted as one of the consistent measures or one of the measures of market risk. And so it is suggested that the dealers across the world, derivative dealers across the world, they use a consistent measure for the computation of the market risk. And uh, using that particular measure, they can set the limits uh, with respect to the trading. They should also perform stress tests, which is the test under extreme market conditions, probably if the interest rates change drastically in a day by 1% or exchange rates uh, fluctuate by more than 2% in a day or uh, the equity prices uh, of a particular security fall by more than 10% in one single day, that kind of extreme scenarios, what is going to happen to the value of the portfolio. The dealers uh, have to perform these kind of stress tests to understand the potential losses that can typically come out under extreme market conditions. The risk management function, which is at an organization level, it should be completely independent from the trading operations. There should, uh, there should not be any kind of uh, interactions or collusions that can happen between the trading function and the risk management function. The credit exposures which are specific to the derivative trading, they should consider both the current exposure which is the current replacement value of the existing positions along with the projected future exposure that is, that is expected out of the replacement costs in the future. And uh, credit exposure to a counterparty, it needs to be aggregated. We talk about, uh, we'll talk about what is called as a netting. The netting agreement should come into picture, especially while talking about the credit exposures to a counterparty. And netting is considered as one of the significant measures which is going to reduce the overall uh, risk, uh, the overall credit exposure for the banks. And it's also said that the individuals who are responsible for setting the credit limits, 
they should be completely independent of those who are doing the trading which is nothing but the front office which is involved in the trading should be completely different from the risk management function who is involved in setting the credit limits and uh, every credit risk mitigation uh, process every credit risk mitigation activity that is being taken up every dealer and end user should assess the cost and the benefits of each one of them uh, because they they might uh, be possibilities where the costs are much much higher than the benefits and it is also saying that the individuals with proper skills and expertise they only should be responsible for trading in the derivatives because the consequences of the derivatives are very heavy trades not properly understood and placed is going to uh, bring the downfall to the bank much quickly compared to a regular downfall the supervisors of the trading activities need to have sufficient amount of uh, knowledge training expertise the system should be properly in place data capturing data processing data settlement you need to have sophisticated systems in place proper accounting mechanisms for all the derivative transactions need to happen all these came out as some of the observations or some of the recommendations coming uh, uh, for the traders and dealers in the derivatives market just to understand the process of netting what we uh, what we can simply see is all the participants in the otc derivatives they uh, whether it is in the interest rate swaps or currency swaps or uh, for any of these uh, inter, uh, over the counter derivative uh, trades they sign what is called as international swaps and derivatives associations master agreement typically called as isda master agreement that contains all the terms and conditions with respect to the derivatives trade and it also contains an aspect called netting what the netting simply says is if a counter let's say a trade is happening between a and b now a and b might have got into 10 different derivative transactions now what it simply says is out of these 10 if a is defaulting with b on one of them it should be considered that it is defaulting on the remaining nine of them as well that is what is netting any time the default is occurring all the transactions are considered as one single transaction so default on one is same as default on all of them that is something which is reducing the credit risk of the bank significantly because a counterparty will always default on those transactions where it has a negative value whereas when it has a positive value it's not going to default on all of them so the bank's credit exposure earlier used to be only those items where the credit exposure was positive for them negative for the counterparty but now it is a net of both the positive as well as the negative it is going to substantially reduce the credit risk because if i look at the simple understanding let's say the bank at an, at some point in time the credit exposures let's say were 10 million minus 5 million and 2 million now the counterparty would have defaulted on this and this so when there was no netting the credit exposure to the bank was 12 million because it will not default on this the counterparty will not default on this so the credit exposure was 12 million that is what i was saying maximum of vi comma 0 so in the first case the vi was 10 in the second case it is 0 because uh, uh, we are talking of maximum of 0 comma minus 5 and in the third case it is to overall coming out to 12 million but when netting comes into picture i'll add up all of them 10 minus 5 5 plus 2 7 so with netting coming into picture the exposure is only 7 million 
So the credit exposure came down and even the credit equivalent total has come down. Even uh, the capital requirement for the bank has come down if it is, in, if it is uh, implementing netting as a part of the process. Exposure, in case when there is no netting, the exposure is simply a payoff from portfolio of options. Whereas uh, when, when there is a netting, we say that the payoff is purely an option on the entire portfolio, one single number on the entire portfolio. This allows the banks to reduce their credit equivalent totals and based on that, their capital requirement is also getting reduced accordingly. Now you see the capital requirement is coming out with this uh, new formula. The credit equivalent is coming down because first they are computing the net replacement ratio, which is nothing but whatever was the credit exposure, whatever was the exposure without the limits or with the limits, with the netting divided by the exposure without netting. Earlier example, with netting, the exposure was 7 million. Without the netting, the exposure was 12 million. And this is what we call as the net, net replacement ratio. And based on that, the modified credit equivalent was computed in the simple form. 60% weightage was given to the net replacement ratio, 40% weightage was given to 1 and that is what is the multiplication factor that was used for the AILI multiplication factor. So the credit equivalent was getting modified through this particular approach. We'll look at one numerical which can make things easier for us. Let's say the bank is having these three transactions. It has got into a three-year interest rate swap for a principal of this much, whose current value is negative, and the add-on amount, AI multiplied by LI, is 5. The same thing goes with six-year forex forward, nine months option on a stock. Now, if I have to really uh, look at the exposure, current exposure part, without netting the current exposure without netting i used to consider these two elements 125 but if i am talking of the exposure with netting i'll consider all three of them 125 minus 60 so 65 is the exposure with netting so based on this i can compute the net the NRR, which is 65 by 125, this becomes the NRR. Now, what we are simply are saying here, once I compute the net replacement ratio, the modified credit equivalent for me comes out as 65 plus 0.4 plus 0.6 times the NRR for me is 65 by 125. This becomes my NRR. And sigma AILI, if I look at in this example, 115 plus 5, 105 plus 5, 110 is the sigma AILI. So this is the capital, this is the credit equivalent that is coming out as a part of this exercise. So the credit equivalent, I can compute it saying 65. See, first of all, without, if I have to compute, then it comes out as 125 plus 110. So 235 was the credit equivalent if, I, if the bank did not consider the netting option. But once it has considered the netting option, it becomes 65 plus 0.4 plus 0.6 times 65 by 125, which is the net replacement ratio. This entire thing is being multiplied by 110. So this becomes the credit, a new credit equivalent. And this credit equivalent, depending on the counterparty, if the counterparty was uh, an OECD bank, 
then the multiplication factor is 0.2 to compute the capital required. Earlier it used to be 0.2 times 235. Now it becomes 0.2 times probably a, a quick calculation if it is around 50% just as a quick number. Right, if this is around 0 0.5, this is around 0 0.3, 0 0.7 times 110. So probably I can look at it at somewhere around uh, 77. So 65 plus 77 around 140 is this particular number. So earlier it used to be 0 0.2 multiplied by 235. Now it is 0 0.2 multiplied by 140. The capital requirement came down drastically for the bank because of the taking into account the netting transaction. That became a very uh, advantageous for the banks as far as uh, maintaining their capital requirements were concerned. And going with this process, after, after a few years, the market risk also started uh, uh, started uh, uh, a research. I mean, there is a research that got uh, that, that got initiated in the market risk uh, related computations, especially uh, for the trading activities. The market risk is computed separately, and the capital associated with that market risk is also computed. Especially the assets and liabilities which are held by the bank for trading purpose. They are treated as a part of the trading book. Those assets and liabilities which are held for investment, long term kind of purpose, especially loans and all. They are treated as a part of the banking book. Any of them which are used for trading purpose, they go as a part of the trading book. Any of them which are as per the core uh, operations of the bank, the lending and the borrowing operations of the bank, they are going as a part of the banking book. Anything, uh, any assets and liabilities that form a part of the trading book, they are marked to market on a daily basis. Their value is computed on a daily basis, both for the assets and liabilities their values are computed on a daily basis and that is what we call as the fair value accounting mechanism. Whereas for those, uh, for those assets and liabilities which form a part of the banking book, they are represented at historical costs. So that is one major thing that came out after, the, uh, after, the, after a few years towards the 1996 amendment. And the capital, even from the bank's perspective, the capital risk, uh, the credit risk capital charge, it was continuing for the balance sheet items in the trading book as well as the banking book, especially except for these transactions, debt and equity traded transactions, it was not considered. And even the commodities and the foreign exchange transaction, they were not included as a part of the credit risk capital charge computation. Because they are moved from that particular capital, from that uh, credit risk capital charge towards uh, market risk based capital charge. For those kind of transactions, they were identified as the market risk and a market risk capital charge has been computed separately. A standardized approach came out wherein for each of the debt securities, for each of the equity securities and foreign exchange securities, commodity securities transactions, a separate capital has been assigned and the entire thing is being pulled together. But of course, at that point in time, the correlation between the different types of assets was typically not considered. And uh, the standardized approach also for some of the banks which had sophisticated processes which were ma maintaining and managing the risk quite effectively even before they were allowed to use their own internal based models to typically arrive at this capital charge. And uh, generally uh, it is like uh, the banks can come out with their own method of value at risk and uh, measure it and convert it into a capital requirement and the banks found it more and more useful because this was reflecting even the correlation between the various risks and it was acting like a good measure of risk and at the same time it has reduced their capital requirement drastically so they were more and more insisting on following the uh, 
the, the internal based model itself. And the capital requirement was typically computed in this way. The value at risk as of the previous day, comma, whatever was the average value at risk over the last 60 days, average value at risk over the last 60 days multiplied by a multiplier MC. The multiplier MC used to have a weightage between 3 to 4. Depending on the backtesting that is generally performed on the VAR computed model. Every model which the bank has really prepared, VAR computation model the banks have prepared, they were backtested. What is that backtesting? Whatever the model the bank has prepared, that same model was compute was used to compute the VAR for the last 250 days. And this two, over this 250 days, there is a comparison with the actual VAR, actual loss. Actual loss is compared with the predicted loss coming from the value at risk. Wherever the actual loss was greater than what was predicted by the model, it was treated as an exception. And uh, the number of exceptions, if they are only 5 out of the 250 days, the multiplier was set at 3. But if it has been increasing 5, 6, 7, 8, the multipliers became 3.4, 3.5 and so on. And where the number of exceptions were more than 10, the multiplier was set at 4. The reason being, overall, the VAR which, uh, which has been specified was 10 day, it's not a 1 day VAR, it's a 10 day VAR, 99% confidence interval based VAR. And once I have a 1 day VAR, if I want a 10 day VAR, I have to multiply it with square root of 10, which is almost 3.16. And that is where we see when I have taken the average VAR, the VAR over the last 360 days, or 250 day VAR over the last 60 days, I am multiplying it with a factor which is very much closer to it. So, out of these, whichever was the highest, that used to be the capital requirement. And uh, on the top of that, a specific charge, specific risk charge for the risk which are more and more company specific. Because this computation was not taking into consideration anything that is specific to the companies. It was primarily based on the market variables only, broad market variables, interest rate index, exchange rate index, stock index, commodity price index. It was purely targeting the broad market based variables but not specific to a company. So that whatever is the charge that is more and more specific to the company used to get reflected in the SRC. And even the SRC for an internal model, it has to be computed through this basis itself, 10 day 99% value. And again a multiplicative factor is uh, used to arrive at the total capital which says that it should be at least 4 and whatever the capital that comes out through this mechanism should be at least 50% of the total capital that is coming out through the standardized approach. Now overall the total capital requirement looking at both the credit risk weighted, credit risk based risk weighted assets and market risk based risk weighted assets, the total is done and 8% of that is being considered. But only exception being for the market risk, tier 1, tier 2, tier 3, any of the capital can very well be used. And tier 3 is nothing but short term subordinated debt original maturity of at least two years, unsecured and fully paid up. So this was the typical uh, requirement that has uh, come, one, a basal one, then a small mo a modification that has come in 1996 and after that it started moving towards the basal two standard 
a lot more modification over the basal one and as a, a, a very standardized structure and framework came as a part of the basal 2 framework right